Right now, this is our question and answer panel. We have uh, all speakers uh, available to, uh, to answer the questions. Please submit them in, uh, in the system. And I have first question. So one, our first question is, are some, anybody, anybody pursuing genetic-based options, exploring population selection, as well as gen, gene editing? Uh, anybody wants to start with a question, with, with answer? Well, I, I think I put that comment in there. I was trying to um, respond to this idea of how uh, we're trying to address the nutritional makeup of these insects. And I mean, most of what we do is through diet manipulation, but there are efforts in place for population selection. So they're trying to develop populations that produce a certain product. So uh, just through natural selection, domestication, if you want to call it that, that's what some people are doing. Others are taking a more aggressive approach in terms of gene editing and genetic manipulation to have an insect produce a certain offspring or certain product. So that's two different pathways that are uh, being explored that I'm aware of in conjunction with diet manipulation. Yeah, maybe I can comment from the European point of view. I think in Europe, uh, they will not be pursuing any gene modification because there's uh, uh, the, the industry wants to see themselves as green, sustainable, uh, without any bad connotation, you know, uh, and GMOs are not well, um, are not welcome, let's say, by the European population. So I think that's, that's not the, the way to go in Europe, uh, more in, into using other live streams of agriculture or going into, into feeding strategies or selection, huh? just as what has been happening with any other livestock. Yeah, there's a paper that we published this week in um, BMC Biology on the population genetics of black soldier flies around the world. And if you're interested in that approach, check, check it out because it talks a lot about domestication processes and that we're seeing that in companies, that the lines they're producing are very specific. So the question uh, we have uh, thank you. The question that we have in the chat is, can you please describe how the insect processed at manufacturing plant? Mm -hmm. So anybody wants to take this question? So I, I want to answer uh, this question for, for general uh, information. So uh, there are uh, various of technology has have been developed to process uh, insects uh, to ingredients for uh, feed or food applications. So uh, for example, is drying. There are different uh, drying technologies has been developed for, for processing insect. And also uh, for the processing technologies, different extraction technology, for example, uh, ultrasound assistant extraction and uh, uh, dry fraction, fractionation and also uh, aqueous oil extraction and uh, enzy enzyme-based extraction. Yeah, it's interesting you point out the drying methods because depending on how you dry them, it affects the nutritional makeup. So the next question for specifically for the uh, Dalan, uh, raw insect oil to table oil, what are the key steps to reach? Uh, for me, it's um, refining, yeah. Just as we do with sunflower oil, canola oil, with any other oils uh, that we use, uh, it needs to have a refining. Probably not the entire refining process, but at least the odorization. And with that, you can achieve, uh, yeah, an oil that is blunt, but not completely blunt. Also, because it can be positive, huh? the the especially yellow mealworm oil has some taste that can enhance uh, things like in donuts, we found that the donuts with the crude insect oil had a stronger flavor, a stronger donut flavor. So it's, uh, yeah, a deodorization, probably not complete deodorization, just partial deodorization can be an option. Um, and if we want to decrease the cholesterol content, content then, um, extracting the cholesterol with the beta-cyclodextrin, for instance. 
it's not much process huh? and it's also not uh, we are not inventing the wheel anymore that's already in the industry from oils and fats from a very long time huh? more than a century that is there so it's just applying the knowledge that we have already in this new insect uh, in this new source yep this is uh, 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 uh this is very aligned with the next uh, next comment or question that was put that that uh, I was uh, wondering about flavor attributes of uh, of the uh, enlotic flavor, because olive oil has very uh, very specific uh, flavor and depends on the sort, depend on how it was processed and where uh, where it was made. So, uh, do you have any specific, more specific descriptions for sensory profile of insect oil? And Jeff, maybe maybe you have also uh, some sensory experience with. Uh, uh, around uh, black soldier fly uh, oil. Talent, well, you can start. Yes, the, there are two types, huh, mainly that I've been working mm -hmm. with. Um, the black soldier fly, it's a very lauric fat, so it, it, I cannot explain what a lauric fat is, but just have a very small amount of coconut oil, and you will see that there is a, a very specific flavor. Um, mm -hmm. In it, that's the lauric fat taste, and in, in black sort of fly, that's overwhelming. So I'm not sure if the odorization can modify this, but I mean it's always worth to to do the, the, the test if the odorization mm -hmm. helps to decrease this aftertaste. In yellow mealworm, um, when you smell the oil uh, alone, it has a very strong animal flavor, and it reminds me um, that of lard but the lard when it's cooked you know not, not the commercial the one that is already fine when it's the crude one uh, just after deep frying pork chops in their fat yeah that's the that's the smell that i always always comes but when it is in a product for instance in the crackers a lot of people re, uh, refer the, the taste as a uh, nutty uh, we have also fried chips potato chips and the uh, people have asked me uh, did you add shrimps? And in the other, in donuts, it just enhances the overall flavor of the donuts. Yeah. So um, that's why we, we were also wondering, okay, which flavors are there and also which ones can be perceived. So this, uh, I'm working on that, uh, on the, the making the profile of the uh, aroma compounds in it. It also would be very interesting to see how it's progressed during a storage and oxidation, uh, and uh, how how flavor changes during uh, during oxidation process. So, Jeff, do you have any experience with uh, with fat? So, sensory experience? I, you know, I, I, a couple of things I was going to uh, say is, uh, Daylon, your your degree. I want to ask you your degree. What is your degree in? I, uh, my bachelor's is in animal science, uh, animal production specifically. Uh -huh. uh, then I did a master's degree in food science and my PhD is in food science yes. uh, specialization in, in, um, uh, in fat, in uh, uh, water, basically. Thank you, Thank you for telling me because I, I that helps me structure my response. So what I was going to say is individuals like uh, Daylon, I mean, that's who you want to talk to because they are miracle workers with food science. I mean, you can take these things and manipulate them and create items I never even thought possible. So I think the we're just scratching the surface on what can be done with these fats and oils. So I'm sure if anybody wants to provide a grant to her to do more research, she'd be interested. Um, so that's one thing. The second is this. Um, so black soldier flies, <clears throat> what you feed them does impact them. <clears throat> so we have to be real careful about what we feed these insects. So even in the company that I own, we, we're very particular about what we feed the insect. Now, when we dry them, um, they're not made for human consumption, but I have to admit, I have eaten some that are dried and it's like popcorn. So that's what it reminds me of. And uh, what we have found is what you feed them and how you process them is really important for that flavor. So we microwave dry. But we also starve the insect and we're really particular. We also do some fermentation process with the waste to standardize it so that the flavor profile of the insect is pretty standardized for us. What we found in terms of shelf life work with our, our insects is that somehow when we process the insect and we store it at room temperature, 
the fats don't oxidize as fast. I don't know what it is about black soldier fly, but they don't. And it could be just storage. I don't know. Uh, Daylon may be able to comment on that or Dr. Lou. So that's what I know. Um, but I will say this too. When you harvest black soldier fly larvae, starve them for 24 hours before you process them for two reasons. One, it makes it faster in terms of processing and it gets their gut content out. So you're not tasting it. <laughs> That's important. And I think if you're processing the maggot with the gut content, some of that gut content flavor is coming in with your, your material. Thank you. And Thank you, uh, Dr. Tamberlin. Uh, Dr. Lu, I think you have a very, uh, very good question. Can you feed the insect, uh, insects used frying oil? Mm. Yeah, I think definitely uh, uh, insect uh, frying oil can be part of the diet of to feed uh, insect because any organic waste can be uh, used to feed insect for uh, growing. Sounds good. And for everybody, people, uh, people are moving more on plant-based and vegan food now. In your view, how we can market and position insect fat, protein, and food? Any extra benefit over plant-based food? I, I just want to say, um, I don't think that the insect market integrates with the vegan market at all, um, being that they're animals. Uh, in terms of benefit, and we had this conversation, uh, the panel before uh, our presentations. The big push for black soldier flies is because it's so environmental. And I think that's a big kick. I think that's a big positive. Also, a question about the frass that's produced from these insects. They can be used as fertilizer. So it can replace like traditional fertilizers. There's another benefit there. Um, and the last thing I just want to say is this. I do think cricket and mealworm can, diets need to be formulated for them that's more sustainable. And I think that can be done. So I think we can diversify the insects as food and feed market, and we can make all the models more environmentally friendly and more sellable. And I think that's a big thing because people vote, they pay their conscience. You know, if they know they're eating something that's going to protect the environment, I think that goes a long way to enhancing the industry. That's just my two cents. Yep, I definitely agree. I think what it's also be, uh, be, uh, beyond sustainability, what insect, uh, uh, insect, insects are offering is a huge opportunity for flexibility, design, design for application, design for optimum use of resources, and have specific fat for design, uh, design and use. This have protein that needed, if it's designed for protein, for, for application and in the most optimal way is the least uh, used resources. Can I make one more comment? Yes. And that is, you know, there is work taking place now, Daylon probably can comment on this too. And uh, Dr. Leo, you may know something about it too, is that is there is work being done now showing how the microbiome of a human yep. responds to this. And there's indications that it's actually quite positive. Because if you think about it, Humans have as pointed out, humans have eaten insects for a long time. There's a selection process there. Um, so the, even the gut response of humans and other vertebrates to insect-based protein and the fats and oils has been very positive. And we're just starting to scratch the surface. Uh, I would uh, like to add a comment uh, regarding this. Uh, how can we use insects in this new protein transition? Um, I would think like for vegans, it's not possible for, but for vegetarians it can, because there are two types of vegetarians. Uh, one type of vegetarian is because of the um, problems, yeah? health problems that they cannot uh, eat certain animal based ingredients, it's okay. But there are others that uh, <laughs> the main driver is a sustainability. So those type of consumers we can reach because uh, the insects are sustainable and they are also, um, um, the, they, they take a look at um, animal welfare. So that's also something that we don't have an issue with insects. Uh, those type of, of vegetarians we could reach with insects also. And we see, I have seen that in my studies. Huh? Um, we have many vegetarians taking part in our consumer studies. 
But however, I do not have the data. I do not have exactly. Mm -hmm. We have never included them, but it could be interesting to know, say, okay, are you vegetarian? And then just ask like, why are you taking part of this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, definitely another comment. And, and with the trend is uh, moving from uh, for the uh, plant-based or vegan-based uh, products, but definitely insect-based uh, protein or fat can ex expand the profile to the whole food system, not just like plant-based system. Yep, so beyond limitations of the uh, plant, uh, plant sources. Wonderful. Uh, next one we have, uh, can BSF oil be refined to kerosene and serve as a biofuel for the aviation industry? How does the melting temperature affect the process? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I know that uh, Hermetia, that's a um, company in Germany, they already produce that, but as a, um, it's not a commercial, just as a prototype, and they produce kerosene with it. Yeah, there's a lot of papers coming out now on this. Uh, we I published a few on it with people from Hawaii and from China, and it's the process is much straight. It's pretty straightforward, and uh, there's lots of potential there. And uh, last one we have uh, last question in the chat. I see. Is the potential for using insect fats for replacement for industrial lubricants currently fossil fuel based? So, and the answer is also, I think, yes, it was covered uh, by Dr. Lu in the first, in the first uh, presentation. Yes, there is, uh, there is a uh, work is in progress. Okay. Let me see if I miss anything because I had some technical. Uh, Are cold extraction methods recommended in order to reduce nutrients degradation already industrial equipment to cold extraction method? Do we have any, any, any comments on the cold extractions? Well, um, in, at the beginning I was using, I was studying uh, extraction, cold extraction, and we did that to avoid um, degradation of amino acids and fats. Um, but it was just as, as in the lab scale, not the industrial scale. In industrial scale, I'm not aware. And I think probably it's not even possible because they need to blanch the insect. So that is, yeah, it's already higher than probably 70, 80 degrees Celsius. So it's, I don't think it's possible. But uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the degradation of the nutrients will be limited. Eh? But, but that's what only what I, uh, expect. I have never studied that part. Sounds good. And overall, as, uh, as this area will be developed, uh, I'm sure that uh, processing part of it will, will advance even, even more and further uh, to, 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 target, to, to deliver target products and product specifications as a, as a, final, uh, as a final product of refining. Uh, I ha we have one more question. In addition to the fat content of the substrate, will the fiber content have a significant influence on the performance of the black soldier flies larvae? For instance, will, be, will there be significant difference in performance when, when the substrate has more plant matter than animal matter? Is it matter, plant versus animal, and what's the, uh, what's the ratio? I think Jeff, you already uh, covered it partially in your presentation. So yes. Yeah, so uh, and this goes back to a question I was asked earlier about what's being fed to the insect. So on blacks, I mean crickets and mealworms are pretty specific what you feed them, and they got the mm -hmm. standardized diet. Black soldier flies, it's like let's throw it at them and see if they eat it, and they eat just about anything. Um, but preparation is going to be important. So if you're going with something with a high fiber content, such as say rice straw, uh, you're going to have to do a fermentation process to loosen up that fiber and make it more accessible to the nutrients, more accessible to the insects. So cellulose is potentially degraded by black soldier flies, but the processing of the material before feeding it to the insect will be critical. Uh, so it can be done. 
And FYI, we did find things they won't eat. Um, I can tell you about that some other time. Uh, just to add a comment, in Europe, it's not possible to do that. Uh, you cannot feed insects with uh, animal sources for safety reasons. So animal sources, you're talking about like uh, offal or, or are you talking like manure, or both? Both. Yeah. Manure, like super prohibited and uh, also uh, meat. So that's one of the reasons why the catering waste is not accepted. Uh, it's not approved as a feed for yeah. insects here in Europe. So they are quite strict in that sense. So I'd, I'd love to make a comment here, and this is Jeff Tomberlin as a professor to everyone that's listening. Yes, there are EU standards that need to be followed for the EU. And yes, there are standards for the US and other areas, but this does not mean that it takes what you do in your country. Um, yeah. These processes can be validated and they can be found to be safe and effective. It's just what some cultures have chosen not to use. So, do not shy away as long as you do it safely and effectively and you determine that it's, it is something that can be done without harming someone. Don't let what we do in our countries dictate what you do. Be, be challenging and think outside the box because animal manure, uh, food waste, these are all viable resources. If you prep them the right way and take the right precautions, you can produce very sustainable protein for livestock. Sorry and also the, 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 your final application, it's related to, to the feed that you can use. Huh? Of course, food is very, uh, has to be produced in a very safe way. Uh, but yeah, if you are using the, the oil for, to produce fuels, for instance, then you don't have those problems. Huh? Sure. Uh, other just... application, huh? surfactants or something else. Yeah. I, I mean, this is the rule for surfactants, let's say. Sure. But for me, you know, I look at the North America, I look at the U.S. and I look at the EU and it's just a small part of the world. And there are, you know, when I think about animal manure or I think about fish offal and other substrates, they can be used effectively. It's just our countries choose not to do it. They choose for various reasons not to follow that. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. I just don't want to restrict anyone else in the world from exploring opportunities to do it because I think it can be done safely. Indeed. Sounds good. Uh, I think we covered all the questions that we have, uh, uh, we have in the chat. So thank you uh, everybody for participation. Thank you audience for uh, listening our, our Hot Topic Symposium. We believe it's important. We believe that this is what's coming and this is what uh, of what relevant to our industry for, for today and tomorrow. Uh, if you have any additional questions or questions that haven't been covered, uh, you are absolutely welcome to send, send your questions to speakers or to me and I go forward them. Again, thank you for your participation. I just want to thank you for organizing this and I want to thank the, thank the presenters for the candid discussion. It's really great. I miss this and thank the audience for the wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thanks for everyone to join this virtual meeting.